We want to move into just briefly, because I want to be mindful of everyone's time. Everyone has um, uh, lots of lots of leukemia patients and work to do. So I want to go into this briefly. We will take a just um, a, a slightly shortened discussion of this, but we have an around the world audience. And I just want to ask one question. And if everybody can line up and answer the question, for your patients who are 70, we're going to talk about a 70-year-old patient, and I'm not going to refer to the patient as older or not older, but a 70-year-old patient. Can I hear from the teams who are still using um, 7 and 3 or CPX for those patients? And what I'm looking for is just to understand who 70 and above who in your practice is getting either a seven and three or CPX? And Jeff, I'm sure you're going to want to talk about the CPX. So maybe you can kick it off 70 and older. So we still treat a healthy number of 70 plus patients with induction chemotherapy. I'm not particularly partial to CPX. I think it's more a question of number one, the patient's goals of therapy. So traditionally we have thought about achieving a remission, a rapid remission as a key endpoint for patients that are interested in a potentially curative transplant. So our decision about induction in a non-adverse molecular group of patients is often considering, you know, their their likelihood of benefiting in terms of a rapid remission uh, to bridge them to a, a transplant sooner than later. And that I, I realize that's changing and that the the uh, transplantability of HMA Ven uh, patients is also on the rise and certainly reason to think that there, there's going to be opportunity to do that. Uh, we also take into account the fact that in, in our neck of the woods down here, there are often, you know, barriers to ongoing continuous outpatient-based therapy so that we have um, the option of a more intensive uh, condensed therapeutic period with induction therapy for fit um, patients age 70 or older or younger, regardless that can then um, you know, result in a remission and the opportunity to receive maintenance therapy that is also clinically beneficial. So there are a couple of different uh, ideas that we utilize to kind of decide whether patients are induction candidates, namely based on fitness and, and transplant eligibility, but also um, you know, what are their goals for care and how realistic is it to be able to treat them for months and months and months on a, a fairly difficult outpatient regimen that requires a lot of monitoring and, and and management, especially in the community. Okay, others. Ours, I want to just hear is is any is anybody? Let me flip the question to make it easier. Is anybody not using intensive induction above a certain age, seventy or otherwise? Does anybody have a clinical practice or a cutoff where not using it over seventy? Well, we use intensive chemo for patients with favorable genetics, according to ELN, and uh, and usually recommend uh, lower intensity approaches, basically clinical trials for the other patients. Okay, so seven and three intensive therapy is still alive. Uh, yes, for favorable genetics. Okay, favorable genetics. Okay, Germany, Lars, or Uva, what's happening? Like, with is there yeah. a shift away from intensive? No, so I mean, for for fit patients, we also would use CPX three five one, especially if if there is unfavorable um, cytogenetics. As we know, for p fifty three mutant, um, the the combination when ASA is also not really doing a great job, right? And then there is this real-world evidence data that with CPX351, even though the the overall response rates are similar to Venasa, that that you get a larger proportion of patients better controlled in MRD negativity, and that this can then of course impact your outcome favorably, especially if you can move forward to transplant with these patients. 
Okay. So I want um I want to hear also from other parts of the world because I, I, I was trying to be a little bit Machiavellian in, in framing the question because whenever you hear older, that is supposed to shift everyone to an HMA Venn discussion. And I don't find that that's the case. I find that the answers are like what I'm hearing, that there are still plenty of use case scenarios for intensive chemotherapy and that all of a sudden when you say older, I'm not getting an answer that every but he just uses HMA Ven for everything. I'm curious though. So we have. Um, I'm not sure if um, our colleague Dr. Tian from can. Are you still on t in Taiwan? What is what is happening for intensive chemotherapy? Again, I'm focusing older, but whatever you call older, 70 and above. Okay. Yes, we, we still use uh, intensive chemotherapy for uh, patients the age of uh, 70. Uh, in Taiwan, uh, Veneto class only reimbursed for patients older than 75 years. If the patient is rich, Taiwan doctor like Veneto class and other setting because it causes less toxicity, but uh, it's expensive, so not all patients can afford the uh, treatment. So uh, we still use the intensive chemotherapy 3 plus 7 or 2 plus 5. And uh, the upper limit of transplantation in Taiwan, in, at least in our institute, Na National Taiwan University, the upper limit of age of transplant transplantation is 75. So uh, for this patient after intensive chemotherapy, if it's a fit uh, donor available, we proceed to transplant. Thank you. Thank you very much. I have another question for intensive chemotherapy inductions, regardless, CPX7 and 3, whatever you want to do. Is anybody off of a clinical trial, just routinely, is anybody adding venetoclax to intensive chemotherapy on a routine basis? So there are lots of data, for example, Flagida plus GO obviously was in an NCRI trial. Flagida plus VEN is a popular regimen coming out of MD Anderson. CLIA plus VEN, 7 and 3 plus VEN has been looked at. CPX plus VEN has been looked at. I'm talking general practice off of a clinical trial. Anybody just throwing venetoclax onto intensive chemotherapy? You can sort of say yes, no, routine practice. Regular patient, 71 comes in, you're about to give seven and three. Not, not I'm in, seeing a lot of like no. Not in first line for, not for in relapse first line. refractory, okay. flavida we would do, okay. but, but not in but first line. But not first line. Okay, I think that's, a, and this is just meant to level set for doctors who are trying to figure out what to do. So there is no hard line in the sand that I'm hearing. There are plenty of fit patients, certainly good risk patients, lots of consideration for intensive therapy, including for older patients. Now, here's my next question. There is a randomized trial. You know that um, uh, Amir Fati is leading, which we will have data on, that did in fact randomize 7 and 3 to um, HMA and venetoclax. So let's say just for argument's sake, because I think we have a lot of data on what happens post-transplant after intensive chemotherapy, we have sort of data emerging on what could happen to patients post-HMA vent. Let's say that we're sitting on this discussion and we know that that's a positive trial. Let's just say it's just as good to get HMA vent versus intensive chemotherapy. Will you how will you interpret those data? Are you anxious to switch away from intensive chemotherapy and just be done with it and move to HMA VEN? Or will you need more information even after that trial is done before switching, let's say, a 50-year-old to HMA VEN? Let's say it's just the same. Everything is the same in that trial. Looks, looks equivalent. Charlie, you're a transplanter, so you know where I'm going with this. So what 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 are we going to do? Are we going to just take the randomized trial and say, okay, chemotherapy is dead? Yeah, well, it's not as simple as that, is it, Gail? Because a lot of this is around disease biology, uh, predicted CR rates with intensive chemo, and day 60 treatment-related mortality. So I think uh, it's very likely indeed, um, and I think, you know, Amir is to be congratulated for this study, 
that uh, in adverse risk cytogenetics, particularly older people who you want to take to a transplant or maybe with a bit of comorbidity or something, where you know that intensive induction chemotherapy doesn't give you very good CR rates and there's, you know, significant day 60 treatment related mortality, that to move to a lower intensive strategy that has an equivalent CR rate and plausibly better transplant outcome because of lower NRM based on Jeff's uh, CPX data, uh, I think that's a very easy sell, Gail. I think the challenge will be to look at a bunch of patients where you still want to take them to transplant, where you can predict higher CR rates potentially with um, induction chemotherapy and acceptable treatment-related mortality. So my sense is that the in use of actually of NA is a doublet will potentially be a real advance in the high-risk population. But if you want my opinion, future studies should incorporate triplets. I think, you know, there's a gimme here, isn't there, with a triplet in the FLT3 mutated space against intensive chemo. And as we develop other triplets, I think that that will allow us to have a higher CR rate that I think for many of us would be the limitation in good risk cytogenetics in the older population at the moment. I don't know if Julie is still on um, from Canada. I'm curious because there, are, I know that there have been um, quite um, challenging sort of venetoclax restrictions, perhaps as there are in in Taiwan too. I think we have to be sensitive of the, you know, the approvals of the agent. That even if there is a trial that shows equivalence, how easy would it be to to adopt um, an HMA uh, ven based regimen for somebody who is not a frail patient? I'm not sure if. She is still on, but let me move. Let me move then to just ask the rest of you: when the when the title of a slide says "older patients," um, how should we advise practicing clinicians to make the decision about what would typically be the 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 sort of standard? intensive versus low intensity because age we just spent the last 10 minutes doesn't seem to matter i think biology matters but if we have to make a statement to practicing decisions can can uh, practicing physicians is there actually an actual numerical age cutoff that we could propose that we are no longer finding ourselves using intensive therapy if you just want to advise somebody in practice that if you have an X age patient or no. So it's really, I mean, such a tough question to answer, as you know, um, and we don't typically advise based on absolute uh, uh, chronologic age without considering other things. But my, my practice in general is that um, as imperfect as it is, you know, we know that, uh, you know, the, the uh, Vialli A study looked at patients who were either over age 75 or had significant medical comorbidities, and that that was sort of a, a guide, a guideline for identifying patients that actually benefited from, clearly benefited from A's event compared to the standard of care. So in general terms, I typically advise an AML patient over age 75 to go down the route of lower intensity therapy with the caveat that if they happen to have, um, you know, uh, you know, an A21 or an inversion 16, um, that and, and they're and they're exceptionally fit, that we could consider therapy with. Um, induction because of its potential curability. Maybe HMA Ben is also curative in those patients, but we just don't have enough, I think, data to really guide us yet. So in general, I, st I'm, I have been using the 75 as a general guideline, but not absolute. Anybody else feel differently about that? No. Okay. So, I mean, I think that what, I think that the, 
the discussion is leading around the fact that we think we can actually have better outcomes for older patients than we used to. And that includes patients who historically have been defined as over 60, then over 65, then over 70, then over 75. So I would actually argue that the discussion should be flipped to make sure that patients are truly being treated for AML. Because again, the point of this forum is also to be educational for doctors who might not be treating a ton of AML all the time. I actually, I'm gonna make a couple of controversial statements and then you guys can react. I think that it is quite the case that we all know that there are certain patients who truly are so terribly ill with other things that they just simply shouldn't be treated for AML we're not talking about those patients. I personally have not been hanging single agent hypomethylators in a very long time on anybody, regardless of age, with the possible exception of TP53 patients who truly, truly, truly are terribly frail. There would be zero consideration of anything more intensive. I don't think venetoclax adds much, but I think we can do the most from an educational perspective by saying that HMA Ven puts a lot, a lot of people actually into remission and that we should make sure that we are treating older, older patients and not giving them single agent hypomethylators. Now that's a controversial statement. So I'm curious from around the world, are there any of the much older patients who are still other than TP53, which I think we all feel venetoclax doesn't do much for, but is anybody getting single, giving single agent HMA to older, older patients. We're now moving away from those who might even get intensive chemo. So if silence means no, that's good. So we're all doing double, we're all doing double induction, even for patients who seem frail and much older. Yeah, I think Gail, I would, I would just- Metaplex is helping. Go ahead. Just mentioning that I agree in general that we're treating most of our patients with HMA Ven. Um, I do have occasion to uh, treat the frailer patient who may have circumstances that make it very difficult for them to withstand maybe the severity of the cytopenias and the need for mon as frequent monitoring um, to consider starting out with single agent HMA, reassessing their disease and adding venetoclax if it turns out that they're not responding sufficiently after a cycle or two of, of AZA or decided being alone. I have done that on, you know, infrequent cases where, where, where I think that the situation warrants it. So it's not completely unreasonable to take in a, a more measured approach in, in certain patients that have, you know, those potential difficulties. I would argue that um, the, I think the combination is definitely a higher CR rate. And usually for these patients getting into remission faster is a good thing. One thing that I would throw out for consideration also is that I think many of us feel that it has been really shown left, right, and center that 28 days of venetoclax is really a lot. The package insert is a lot. And a lot of us have moved, you know, Jeff, for the patient that you're talking about, who is a, well, can they really get through this? I will absolutely confess to things like 14 days of venetoclax instead of 28 or 21 days and do a marrow. I think that there is flexibility there that is really being shown that 28 days is, is a lot. I think obviously watching the concomitant medications also in terms of cytopenias is really um, important. But I think that to, to, I think I want to close this just to, to be mindful of of everyone's time. I actually think it's really valuable to have an induction chemotherapy for older patients slide that goes into a discussion of intensive chemotherapy. I think that's important to recognize that there are still patients who, first of all, the definition of older, and secondly, intensive chemotherapy in AML is not dead. The second thing is to be quite selective about trying to, you know, to make sure that the patients really are given a chance for remission, try to give them as much treatment as you can to get them into remission, see if you can get them through some form of, um, of HMA VEN. I think the days where people are saying, oh, this patient is too old or too frail to get combination therapy, I think that's not happening as much anymore, which is a good thing because a lot of these patients can go into remission if they are carefully managed. And I really want to thank everyone for staying on the line.